Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's workshop, Leveraging Partnerships for High Quality Community Schools and Out of School Time. We are so excited to have this as part of our sustainability series. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about our sustainability series, you can find more information on our website. Our next session is coming up on April 26th, and then we'll have one on May 10th. Uh, they're always at the same time. We also uh, will hopefully see some of you all at our in-person conference coming up uh, about two weeks from now, uh, a little under. Uh, we'll, we'll have a sustainability track on Saturday. Registration for that is closed, uh, but we do hope that some of you all will uh, be there. You can sign up for alerts for this series if you're not already receiving them uh, at tinyurl.com slash NYSNYS series. Our next workshop, as I mentioned, will take place on April 26th at noon. Uh, that workshop is Sustaining What Works, the State of Stimulus Funds. And I will put the uh, registration link along with the resources I'm about to discuss into the chat box now. We hope to see you at that as well. That will be a uh, facilitated discussion as well as some presentations. Uh, I'd like to begin by telling you a little bit about the Network for Youth Success. Uh, we are the uh, statewide network for after school summer and expanded learning opportunities in New York. We are also the affiliate for the National After School Association for the state of New York. We're one of 50 statewide after school networks and affiliated with the After School Alliance. We serve as the backbone for the New York State Community Schools Network and we're the state lead for the National Girls Collaborative Project, working to increase gender equity in STEAM programs. We have 15 regional networks throughout the state. You can see a map there uh, so that you can get connected. Uh, and there's more information on the resource link that I put into the chat box if you'd like to get connected with your regional network. Uh, and we work to increase access to high quality programs and services outside of the traditional classroom. Uh, we have a number of resources available. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but just did wanna mention a few. Uh, we have a page on addressing and leveraging learning loss uh, that includes the sustainability series information. A uh, guidebook on school community partnerships. We're actually in the process of updating, uh, but you can find the current one with a lot of relevant information and resources on our website. Uh, there are resources for starting an after school program, for assessing the quality of your after school program, and we also do offer credentialing and accreditation and health and safety trainings uh, in our Site Leader Institute. Uh, I mentioned our regional after school networks. We also have a free job posting site, afterschoolpathfinder.org. If you'd like additional free training series in this um, webinar format, we have a very full uh, series on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion that's ongoing uh, that you can find at that resource link. Uh, and many more resources available at that link in the chat. And I'll put that again for folks that are just joining as well. Uh, I did want to call attention to one particular uh, resource, which is the Power of Us Workforce Survey. That is currently open, and it is closing at the end of this month of March. Uh, and it's very important that we get as many folks from New York to take this as possible so that we're able to get state-specific data which will help us learn more about staff members and volunteers that work with young people every day, uh, either in after school, summer, expanded learning opportunities, anywhere uh, youth play, learn, and grow outside of the school day. Uh, this workforce information will be incredibly helpful uh, for advocacy efforts. It's part of a national movement and folks that take it are entered to win gift cards. So we do hope that you'll take that. The link is in the chat and I will enter it again as well. Uh, we hope that you'll stay connected, sign up for our listserv, follow us on social media. You might want to become a member. Uh, we do share a monthly grant newsletter with our mem members. Um, I mentioned our JEDI training series and the sustainability series. Uh, and today's workshop, again, is leveraging partnerships 
for high quality community schools and out of school time. We're so glad to have you here with our wonderful presenters. And I'm going to turn it over to today's moderator, Jay Roscoe. Everybody, thank you so much uh, for making time to be with us. We have an incredible panel uh, today. We have Val Fanning and Ed Rose, both working uh, out of SOTUS. Uh, then we have Joanna coming with us from coming to us from Western New York, and Mirna is with us uh, from New York City. So we are really covering uh, all over uh, New York State today. We are uh, hopefully uh, you're you're recognizing somebody that's close to your neck of the woods, and I'm going to ask each of these uh, panelists to get us uh, to get us going. Uh, really by responding to to a question that I hope is part of what uh, what you're here to learn about, uh, which is how partnerships can add value uh, to what we do when we're operating in schools or in community centers or wherever your programs uh, are occurring. And um, I'm Jay Roscoe. I work with community schools in Wayne County. And um, I've been doing work with after school uh, after school programs for uh, about 20 years now. And I have to tell you that um, when I first started, uh, I was definitely worried about, gee, how are things going, where I'm at in my place. Uh, but as I tried to improve, as I tried to grow, um, I realized I couldn't do it alone. So I really hope you're able to take to heart uh, what these uh, these veterans, these uh, experienced folks uh, have to share uh, about partnership with you, and I'll ask them all to introduce themselves a little bit more and share about their programs as they also talk about uh, uh, the value of partnership and what strong partnerships look like uh, in, in their setting. So, Mirna, if we could actually uh, start with you, and you could please uh, tell us again a little bit about your program and what strong partnerships look like in your setting. Sure. Thank you, Jay. Um, so just a little bit about me. I am a deputy director for the Children's Aid uh, programs in Washington Heights, Inwood and East Harlem. And right now that's overseeing nine schools that cover grades actually pre-K, uh, three-year-olds through high school, depending on what region they're in. And I'm again referring to those different communities. In our programs, we are the primary partner in the school. We offer an array of programs that include early childhood, um, school-based health centers. So we provide medical, dental, and mental health services. We have after-school programming as well, including the holiday program and summer camp enrichment, um, now titled Summer Rising. So we incorporate a lot of the academics. We have parent programs, both during the day and in the evenings that include ESL and high school equivalency programs for our parents and adults in the community. And we also provide um, just a lot of work in partnership with our principals. Jay, I wasn't sure if you want me to continue to, to introduce just the part of the work, answer the question, or let my colleagues also introduce themselves. I think um, if you could talk just, I think you can go right ahead and talk about partnerships in your setting. And um, and again, what and what strong partnerships look like. I mean, you mentioned yourself, you're the, in many ways, you are the primary partner. Um, so it sounds like maybe part of your role is to draw in other partners with the school. Absolutely. So, and the other thing I should say is that I'm also a licensed social worker. That's my, uh, that's what I studied, right? So I bring those lens into the, into the work because it's so important as we are developing relationships, as we are developing partnerships that we are considering the relationships that we want to cultivate and continue to grow. Um, what does it look like at a children's aid community schools in terms of partnership? It looks like we are mission aligned. We meet with our partners day, um, weekly, and sometimes it could be daily. And our partners, our primary partners, are the principals of the schools. Um, looking at assessing what are the needs that we need to pay attention to, right? I, doing a needs assessment to identify the gaps, and then looking at our resources, um, and specifically what kind of funding streams do we have to be able to address those needs and how are we pooling our resources together where we may not have specific uh, funding for an area that's been identified? How do we make it work? Um, in partnership, we're looking at how do we integrate our services? 
How are we coming together in governance? So what are the structures in the school that we need to be at the table and who else needs to be at the table? Whether it's your school leadership team, your building council, the school safety teams, um, there's a building response team, who needs to be represented to make sure that no one feels left out. And again, we are getting everyone's perspective. Um, it is not about us, it is about those that we serve. Um, so making sure that we're also analyzing data, making decisions that are data driven and that are informing our practice. If we are seeing a direction that we're going in that is not serving us, then how do we shift? And again, who and what do we need to have in order to do that? Um, making sure that we're constantly communicating with one another. Partnership is also having structural time, meaning you are going to have a time weekly to get together with that partner. First, your principal, because again, the, the partnership is between the CBO and the principal to drive the mission of the school. It is not my program, my school, it's our program, our school, our children, our community. And it is about transforming what we want to see, the progress that we want to see made in, in all three, right? In our children, in our communities, with our families, that really will have the greatest impact. Um, trying to think of, uh, I think I've said pretty much a lot about what I wanted to say. In terms of the value with just bringing partners together, the other thing I did want to add, even though we are the main partners, we're always looking to see who are the exter external partners in the community that can add to our mission. Um, we know that mental health right now is a top priority for many of our many of our schools, many of our programs in essence. So our, where we don't have the funding, for example, to maybe get a mental health counselor or an additional mental health resource, perhaps there's a neighboring hospital that we can partner with and have them come in to do, um, whether it's through, psycholo through a psychologist or a psychiatrist, to give that service to the children so that we are, again, being a uh, utilizing a comprehensive approach to support the needs that we've identified in partnership. Mirna, I think that's phenomenal. And I heard you talk about uh, data, systems, and practices, something that's near and dear to me with MTSS work. And I heard you talk about structured time, and I love the shared ownership language. Um, and I just uh, want to pivot now to Joanna and have you talk about you and your program and your setting and what partnerships uh, might look like uh, in your context. Hey, everybody. I'm Joanna, and I'm from Buffalo, New York excited about that I just want I don't know why Jay and Ali asked me to do this I just I just go shopping and run programs <laughs> uh, I am the current vice president of youth services for the community action organization of western New York which is our second largest social services nonprofit in western New York um I use the example I don't know how old you are so if you're in my age bracket and above we are the Sears of social services. If you are younger than I am, we are the super Walmart and Target of your generation when it comes to social services. And so what that means is our organization is like the one-stop shop um, for the majority of the things you need, right? But you still need some other groups outside of us to make sure that we're partnering so that you can get everything that your family needs. So the, the realm that I specifically have more um, of the reins in is working with children from ages five through 21. And in our programs, we run extended or expanded learning time um, opportunities. So we have eight after school programs and we have four summer camp programs that we run. Our after school programs are Monday through Friday. Four are within com local um, community centers and the other four are within um, Buffalo Public Schools. Um, the schools directly. And so what we do in the summertime is we then shift to serve not only those students, but the other students who were in other programs during our full day summer camp, which is 830 in the morning until 530 p.m. And then all of the adults go to sleep. <clears throat> That's what you got to do after you work with kids all day like that. <laughs> um, when it comes to partnership, our, we thrive on making sure that not only can the people who we hire to work within our programs, which our frontline workers are called youth services with an S, 
because they're going to provide a myriad of services for our students. Um, not only can they facilitate activities with our kids, but we make sure that we partner with other groups who have sole purposes to provide activity, interactive, that's the key thing for us, interactive activities for our students to participate um, in. And I'll get into a, a little bit what that looks like in terms of the myriad of services that are in fun activities that our kids get to participate in with. Um, but when it comes to why I think in, uh, partnerships are important or what the big thing of having them is, is it's the expansion of all that you can offer to your children and your families, right? Because there are some of our partners that they're not about serving the kids directly, they're providing a dynamic service that our parents need to make sure that the children are having a holistic experience. That's phenomenal. Um, and again, that that whole hour, and I think that's the that's a recurring theme I'm hearing, and I and I know that uh, uh, Val and Ed are are right there too with the uh, the capacity to create a sense of um, these are all of our children, right? And um, this is a, a collaborative effort, and that sense of shared mission is something that I think uh, I'm hearing uh, repeated. And Val and Ed, you both uh, um, you're both working in the same program, uh, and we have a chance here to have both a school and a and a key partner uh, together on the call here. So I'll let you guys introduce yourselves a bit, and then maybe Val you could talk about from the school's perspective the value of partners, and then Ed maybe you could talk about as a as a partnering agency what you um, what you see as far as the uh, what the partnership relationship looks like and feels like. Thank you, Jay. Um, I'm Val Fanning, Director of Grants here at SOTUS. Um, I started working in grants um, 20 years ago when I was in college. It was the, the perfect position for me to leave Oswego and come to SOTUS and assist students after school. Um, so, you know, after school programs have been um, something I've been passionate about um, most of my life. I I went to school here in SOTUS and I was part of the youth program that was here um, and I felt that, that it um, ben benefited me as well as um, my surroundings. So um, I started with uh, directing the 21st century grant here at SOTUS and we had um, programs from kindergarten to 12th grade. I'm currently the um, extended school day grant director here at SOTUS and I've learned over the years that um, um, in order to sustain programming and to build on programming, um, partnerships were the most valu valuable thing we could have. Um, we, we have a dedicated staff and um, a lot of teachers that want to be involved in after schools, but it's very hard for them to commit to staying here um, through the evening because of their long school days and other commitments. So we've, um, here at SOTUS, we've built great strong relationships with partners and um, I'm excited to share some of those with you all today. Um, Ed Rose is a clear example of a way that we we worked with Peaceful Schools to bring uh, that resource here to SOTUS and I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, hi, I'm Ed Rose. Um from Rochester, New York. I feel like I have to say that since Joanne and shouted out Buffalo. Uh, I'm a Peaceful Schools community advocate uh, and I serve uh, SOTUS Central School District or well, I serve SOTUS community. Um, I feel like I've been an advocate for a few years, but now that, but I feel like now I have the actual title, title of advocate. Um, as a partner, I feel like we help the school fill the, gap, fill the gaps that they can't necessarily do because I know some uh, teachers and staff members want to go out to the houses and help families, but having a strict day where they can't do it, I feel like that's where I come in as a partner. Um, what do strong partnerships look like? Going back to that question, I think just being flexible and creative, especially now where, I mean, COVID is still around, but our kids and our families were affected a lot by COVID. And I feel like you have to be flexible with the students and their families. And uh, you, got, you have to be creative. Like you have to come up with different solutions. And I feel like that's 
what a strong partnership looks like. like well, I really appreciate uh, the the general discussion around partnership and the introductions of your settings. We've got some school settings, some community settings, some partners and schools on the call. So we, we've got a lot of perspectives. So I just want to take a second to folks on the call and say, please feel free to write your questions into chat. Uh, I've got a list of questions we're going to keep working through, but you feel free, please, at any point in time to say, hey, I'm in a school setting. Have you bumped into a situation like this or do you know about that? And uh, we are we are glad to pivot and answer, answer questions from chat as we go. And if we don't get them as we go, we'll certainly grab them uh, at the end. What I've enjoyed on some of these calls is that our partners have, uh, I'm sorry, our participants have asked questions that we had written out and planned to answer later. So that was good. That meant that we had understood what the need was. One of the things I do think, um, you know, we talked about, I already heard uh, some key pieces, right? I heard that structure that time, identify clear needs and gaps, move to fill those gaps, um, I, you know, some very specifics, what I'm, uh, very specific guidance or, or, uh, or tips or strategies. What I'd like to see as we talk about um, what value to partnerships add to programming, I'm going to come back to Joanna for this one. Um, hoping Joanna too, you can give some specific examples, even if it's the story of uh, uh, any one family or any one partner or something like that. If you got that, if not, general values, uh, general value is good too. And then I just also gonna, uh, I don't know if you saw that bus coming or not, but I'm just gonna throw you right under it and say like, can you now think of some specifics? Because I think that's something that. Um, people are definitely going to want to know is like, oh, it worked like this or it worked like that. So anything that you can do to uh, to help share some of that. Um, I know you said you just uh, go shopping and run program. That's all uh, I do. That's all you do. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you do it so well. We want to hear more about it. So you keep I on. I appreciate going. that. Yeah. So, okay. What value do partnerships get? Okay. A, a lot of value. That's it. So if you leave with anything else, it's, um, the answer is a lot. So go find some. Um, so similar to what Val and Ed mentioned is the dynamics of being a community advocate together, right? And so the value I'll see, I'll start with the, the bigger value. Myself as a CBO, community-based organi um, organization, partnering with Buffalo Public Schools, which is our local school district, the first added value that they get is number one is that the state of New York will offer them less money if they were directly offering these services themselves, because they're going to count it in terms of all of the funding that the state of New York and the federal government gives to them. And so to balance that out across the state, they'd get a lower amount by partnering the district, partnering with us as a CBO and the others that are in our area, we add more than $50 million of resources to our area because they have to fund our CBOs offering those direct services into the school districts. So that's the first one. When we talk about the school districts partnering with us, it's more than just hey, you all come in and do this, run a program, right? It's that alignment with the school day that's going to happen for what we call extended learning time, right? Or ex expanded learning is what I, I, right? Extended, nobody wants extended time to, to be at work, right? No, said nobody, including children. But expanded opportunities sounds a little bit better, right? I just don't want my waistline to expand. So, what we're looking at is, I have an example of one of the schools. I met this, um, a principal haphazardly, right? We were doing, I signed my team up for a, oh, I can't remember the name of this, the training, a, a Dignity for All Act had come out. And it was like the new hot topic. I signed my entire team up, frontline people and managers. Everybody had to go into this training. And while we were in this training, which was virtual during COVID, I mean, us and the facilitator were just back to like just flowing and the answers to questions. And then I facilitated, I'm a very hands-on leader. And so I facilitated some conversations within my team. Like, I'm like, can we just pause for a minute? And I needed immediate feedback from them. So, so I knew that they were paying attention and that we were all on the same page. Well, fast forward to the end of that session, the presenter was just so blown away. He was like, I love, you get it, you get it. And your people's response to what you're doing, like that's everything. Like, where are you guys? 
when we literally, our headquarters is around the corner from his school. Didn't know he was a school principal. He was working in his side job as um, a professor from a local college. And that conversation, us seeing how aligned we are in terms of what we want to offer to the children and the families in our area led to us having further conversation about how do we get into your building? Right. He wanted us as a partner to fully align and wrap around the services, our services around the families that his building serves. Um, now we were able to and luckily he called us just in time for that a year later, we stayed in communication and we followed up with applying together for the 21st Century Community Learning Centers funding. Um, so we were removing ourselves from one of our school buildings and we were then adding a new building and it, was, it ended up being his building. The collective response that we have together is that when he has an idea for his parents, he immediately brings that to us as his partner. Right. And so my coordinator, who happens to be in the room at this time, shout out to Ms. Raven. She is always ready to jump in. Right. Quick example of what that looks like is he said, hey, holiday season is coming up. Black Friday is coming up. People are have all these discounts. I want to do a date night for parents like go shop and buy your kids their gifts. But my teachers are not going to stay after school for them to do that. Raven's response is immediately and emphatically. I got it. So you want us what time to what time? All right, we're going to be in the building until 8.30 at night on a random Friday so parents can go shopping and do whatever. We'll pay our team. We'll do interactive activities with the kids and no problem. That's what partnership is, right? It's about any idea that either either side of the partner com partnership comes up with, how do I support, right? You don't have to have the complete answer. I just need to tell you what I'm looking for in general. And then you tell me how you can make that happen. Um, we also talk about the, so that's the bigger partner, right? My school and the people running the after school program. The next piece is the activities that we offer to our students. Do I love my team members, my frontline youth services counselors with all my heart? And when I tell you I am a mama bear and I go, after people for talking to my team wrong, respect is a big thing for me for everybody. And loving what we do is, is the next piece of that. In that love, I recognize they are not as dynamic uh, uh, at crocheting, at drill, at dance, at karate, at martial art, other martial arts, at arts and crafts and painting. They can't do that. And so my job <laughs> and my coordinator's jobs are to go out in the community and to find vendors who can partner with us for a shared goal, right? Our shared goal overall is our mission statement, which is to promote the self-sufficiency of our youth through, and we have three pieces to that, which is the first one is intentional, which means we pick exactly what we want to do with them. We, once we pick that thing meaningful, how do you take that thing that you wanted to do with the kids and what meaning, what are the objectives they're supposed to get out of this, right? Intentional, then mean, make it meaningful. And then the third thing is engaging, which means every single child sitting in a seat in your room must be actively participating. So you can't play tic-tac-toe, right? We want to do board games with kids, you know, teach them some stra strategy and strategic play. That's great. But if only... Two out of the 10 are actively engaged and the rest are waiting. You're asking for trouble. So actively engaged. What does that look like? Did you make a giant tic-tac-toe board and everybody only gets to move one piece? Are they the tic-tac-toe pieces? Are they running and moving washcloths so that there's no such thing as out? There's only all in, right? What does that look like? Strategic, right? And if you do those three things, you are intentional, you have meaning within what the activity you're going to do, and you find a way to keep them all actively engaged, it is going to give us what our fourth piece in our mission statement is, which is enriching education. If you have those three, it can't be anything but an enriching experience with those children, right? But if you remove at least one of those, it now is not enriching. It's just a plain piece of uh, something that is just being ingested and going to come out. And that looks like corn. So we don't want corny programming. We want programming with strong sustenance. And we get that with having partners who are going to be fully engaged and make sure that they're doing what we are asking to do with our kids to get them to be a self-sufficient adult later. All right. No corny wow. programming. That was yeah. powerful. I, I, I hope uh, I hope corny jokes are okay because that's all I got. But uh, no corny programming. I'm with you on that. We'll accept so your jokes. All right, I'll take. Okay, good. 
Oh, there was a lot there. Uh, there was a lot there. Uh, so we really, um, what I want you to hear uh, and your questions indicate uh, that question from uh, Monique, that question from uh, Daniel, the question from uh, Nafisa. I hope I got your name right. My apologies. I'm working on names, but I just want you to know that those questions, if you look at the chat questions, they're going all the way down to that micro level, that day-to-day -day level, that engaging uh, tic-tac, you know, if it's tic-tac-toe, it better be what, right? All the way to that, that financial ad, that uh, how are you drawing value in? Um, really insightful that there's all kinds of resources there. And how do we go get them and organize them and bring them in? Um, Mirna, you want to uh, chime in a, a bit more here? And then um, I can see Joanna. I don't know if you want to check the chat and I'll read those questions to you, but you got a couple specific for you. And if you can have Val and Ed check the chat too and be ready. And then um, Mirna, if you just want to continue on that discussion of just the value add, and you mentioned before that you're the primary partner and part of your role is what uh, Joanna was starting to really get into there is going out and finding some of those other partners that maybe needed to fill needs. Absolutely. I, I definitely want to go and join Joanna's program now because it's not corny. <laughs> I'm like, I'm ready to go wherever she is in Buffalo, even though I'm in New York City. Um, amazing, amazing. And definitely speaks to all of the qualities and components that are needed to keep children engaged. I think additional, when I think about value added and bringing external partners, one partner, one group of partners that we can never forget are our parents. And really looking at the resources that they have in terms of their own selves, the training, because we often think of our parents, yes, they are busy, but they also come with their own talents. And many are looking for ways to give back. We have found that many of our parents, when they come into our family and community engagement programs, a lot of them are leaders. A lot of them will engage other parents in workshops with what they bring whether it's around social and emotional topics, whether it's around computers. Uh, we have a father who teaches our computer classes to other parents. Um, we have a father who was teaching um, children, ch uh, other parents chess. So it's what, and again, that shows just how can they engage in these games with their children at home. It really is to empower parents to then go back and create a different kind of home environment that keeps children engaged to Joanna's point, to keep them engaged in learning, problem solving, because we do that in chess, um, but also it helps parents to further their own understanding around how the schools are functioning today. We've done trainings around understanding the educational system for many of our immigrant families and how to advocate and make sure your voice is in that room when it comes to your child's education, when it comes to school safety, when it comes to community safety. Who are the people that you need to go out to and speak at a community level? And we do that work with parents around advocacy, right? Um, why? Because they live in the community and they are the ones that can go to their elected officials and create the changes that they want to see. Um, so the value of having a partnership and not just, yes, we are the main partner, but also again, looking externally to see who else, like the NYPD, New York Police Department, we need them here as well. Um, so that they can support the communities that are right now going through so much during this time. Um, just recognizing also the staff, our staff bringing in the value to uh, what's happening during the afternoon, but also doing professional development for our teachers so that this, there is an integration in the way that we are communicating with one another and that the message that is happening during the day is also filtering through during the afternoon but the same kind of youth development principles are being infused during the day, right? Again, strengthening the relationship, strengthening those co connections and bonds and making sure that we are constantly in communication and may, being aware of any issues that come up that can impede the work that we're doing in partnership. Um, I will share it back to you, Jay, because I know there were so many yeah. wonderful questions in the chat. There's a lot of questions. This is great. The, um, the strong bonds, um, can really be put to the test sometimes. And in fact, uh, one of those tests came to SOTUS uh, this past year with the, the 21st century grant uh, was not uh, was not refund was not funded again. Uh, there, um, the the funding formula changed a little bit at the state level, 
um, became more competitive uh, in, in uh, especially in the region that SOTUS is in uh, and in other, other areas um, that that distribution was a little more, a uh, little, little tougher to navigate for some places. And um, happy ending to that, it looks like we're going to get partial funding a little bit later there at, at SOTUS. So uh, good for, uh, good for SOTUS there, but Val, boy, you had, uh, you had a bit of a scare there. And I think that uh, you were sharing that your partnerships uh, were really helpful during that time. And we've gone this year without uh, uh, funding there of uh, 21st century, and you've relied a lot on, on partnerships. Can you talk about how partnerships can be part of sustainability? Yes, thanks, Jay. And I, I did notice um, one of those partners is here, um, Ryan Kincaid from Wayne County 4-H program. Uh, give a shout out to our Cornell Cooperative Extension in out of Newark, New York. Um, so, you know, it was devastating to hear that we were not funded. Um, we received the 21st Century Grant and were very successful even through the pandemic. Um, Mr. Rose and I uh, met students virtually and we didn't shut down. We, we found a way to still connect with kids. Um, so, you know, losing that funding, uh, uh, Jay, Jay really helped guide me into um, reaching out to different partners and working on a sustainability plan and what that looked like. So we did use um, some funds that we got from aid from the state to help cover some of those um, tutoring costs for teachers. But then we really relied on partnerships that um, would come into the, the building and um, provide services and enrichment to our students at little to no cost. So um, it was a little bit nerve wracking taking a budget and cutting it in half, but we found ways to do it. Um, so I would emphasize that um, the Network for Youth Success helped me understand um, to survey, not only um, survey your staff, but survey your families, survey your students, survey your teachers, um, build an advisory to help you overcome those types of challenges. So we had to go to the table and say, okay, um, yes, we, we lost the 21st century funding, but what can we keep? What what do, um, what do we value the most? What do we want to sustain um, at program? And we, we didn't lose numbers. We actually gained students. It, it, was, it was amazing. Um, our numbers went up after we lost that. So um, I worked with Jay and um, we looked to our partners to help um, continue some of those programs. So uh, one, one example is, um, our summer programming. It was difficult to run on a, a no summer budget, but we partnered with the University of Rochester to come to SOTUS at no cost to um, run a STEM science camp with us. Um, we, we worked with ESL Credit Union to um, help sustain some of that summer work. So, you know, Jay helped write a grant to sustain some of the summer programs so we can continue those. Um, but without the partnerships of Cornell, um, we wouldn't, we would have lost our healthy cooking classes. Um, we have uh, a master gardener that comes to us at no cost here from Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, in addition to that, we have around the table cooking. So they push into um, two of our after school programs and we just, we, we work together as a partner to continue to teach those healthy cooking um, courses and also um, expose our families to that resource. So we will invite our partners into, um, you know, open resource fairs, open houses, uh, family nights. Um, we also reached out to, um, I'm just thinking of some of the partnerships that stayed with us over the years. Peaceful Schools was definitely one of them that helped us keep Ed Rose here so that we can continue our mentoring programs. Um, and we, we looked to colleges to help us sustain um, other mentoring opportunities. And some of those were virtual with um, Hobart and William Smith. Um, that's just to name a few. Uh, I might be missing a couple. So I wanted to ask Ed to maybe um, chime in a little bit because he's helped with a lot of our sports camps because our, our students really, uh, 
uh, you know, they ask for those. Yeah, I feel like we have a little bit too much to name, but I do want to go back to what Mirna said about uh, don't be afraid to ask parents about their talents, uh, staff about their talents. Um, currently, I have my mom coming and doing baking classes with families for little to no cost. Uh, a woman earlier this year, before school even started, a woman stopped me at the coffee shop and said she does volleyball for little to no cost and she would love to get into sodas. Now she's teaching our elementary kids uh, to do volleyball. And she also ran camps for some of our older kids. So just, I, I feel like, don't be afraid to reach out to the community that you work in, because there are some people with hidden talents uh, that you can uh, uh, utilize. I think that's great advice. And you know, it's really sometimes can be about that, uh, that starting small. And you know, if you can't come in to run a, uh, a 10 week program, you know, can you can you come in and uh, and do do a one day or something like that? And you know, I think um, Joanna, we're coming back to you and um, to respond a little bit to that. And also, people were there was one question in the chat that we had on our on our planned agenda here too, which was say like, how do you get all this partner business started anyway? Uh, right. And like right, you know, like oh, you hear like Val's talking about having this advisory board put together. They get this huge state grant disappears and they go to this team of people that's already ready and they come up with answers and then the program even expands. Well, that, that's incredible. But how'd you get there? How, how do you even start on the partner, getting on the, getting on the partnership train here? What do you, uh, uh, what advice do you have? The partnership train. I love that. <laughs> First, well, I'm, and thank you for asking because I was over here like, please tap me because I got some things I want to share, but I'm not going to type all that. Um, first, I do want to give a shout out, Ed, because I didn't even know when we were talking before, I didn't even know you were through peaceful schools. Um, and I just love our peaceful. I love Joanna and Dr. Laura. Like, those are my girls. I'm just so excited. Um, so I'm sorry, super delayed reaction, but hey. <laughs> Um, we partner with partner with peaceful schools in our area. They what they do in our programs is they provide our social social emotional support programs. So uh, and they unfortunately we didn't have enough funding, but we're going to be expanding soon um, for them to start small. Right? They, we just needed you to come in and do at least six sessions with our kids. We can't get you from the full year because we've got eight sites and they only had a, one person that they could hire at this time, uh, which I saw somebody mention. We are all struggling. The state of New York and this entire country. Um, so please know you are not alone in the hiring shortage. That is all of us. And we are still working to encourage people to, to jump back into this part of the workforce. Um, but back to the question that was asked, and thank you, Jay. And I think it was Daniel who may have posed it in the chat. I, um, the first thing is be encouraged. Like Ed said, his mom is coming in to do something, right? Don't overanalyze who a partner or vendor can be. Um, I have a success story that I want to share. There is a, a local vendor in our area who has, she, when I first met her, so I went to elementary school with her. She looks at me like a big sister and we were talking one day. She, she started doing some random dance classes and people were like, you know, I wish you taught some dance, like more of these, you know, cause we party at a, at a club and have a great time. And everybody was like learning these dance moves from her and from me. And then, you know, they, she said, you know, actually, I think I could teach a class. Like maybe I'll do one or two. She did. And it was lucrative for her, but she was like, I don't know how to fit that in my schedule. We talked one day and she said, I really hate my job. Like, I don't feel like she was selling insurance. She was like, this is not, it's not, I don't feel lit. I don't feel like my light is shining when I do this. She said, well, what makes you shine? Her response was, if I could dance, every day of the week and make money to pay my bills, I would do that. From that one conversation we had, I then told her, I said, if I invest my company's money in your business, and I told her all I, I said, you don't have a track record yet to prove that you are worthwhile as a vendor. But if I give you 25 to $50 per hour, right? She, I said, how much do you make at your current job? She said, I'm making 21. I said, if I, will you carve out time until your job that on these specific days of the week, you are not available to work anymore. And I gave her her first contract with us was for $50 an hour to do a dance fitness program with my kids. She said, I, I will, I don't know what that looks like, but I'll figure it out. 
And then I told her, you got to be intentional about the moves they're going to be doing. It has to have meaning about the music that they're playing and what they're doing. And you got to make sure every single kid, even including the ones who got two left feet and think they can't dance, want to dance, make it engaging. She said, I got you. She did it. We did her first test run, did a, a formal MOA with her. When I, I then took her and now she had my program, my students' feedback, my staff's feedback on that program. I then put her in front of the entire um, after school network of Western New York. And I shared the videos and the pictures from our program. I let her talk. She did a demonstration in front of 58 other after school partners. And because I gave her that first step, that next year she was able to leave her job, right? First year she left, first year it was part time. Next year it was full time. She was able to do it because she had all of these contracts. And then the third year she was then able to hire people so she can be in more places than one. So you don't know someone's story, right? Where they currently are may not be where they're destined to be. But if you have open conversation and dialogue with people, you can get them. And I'll also tell you the perk in that is that when ever her new year comes around and she's lost people or she's trying to read, she sends me an email first. What days do your people want my program? And I've also been able to stay lower than, so now she's at about $225. I'm like, I'm not paying you more than $150 in my budget because I'm where you got started. <laughs> so use it, right? Have those open conversations and that dialogue, right? And, and, and then share it with other people in your area. If you are not an active member within your um, local network that is connected to Network for Youth Success, find them get connected. Use, I think at the beginning, Allie posted the links. Go to the website for Network for New York State, Network for Youth Success. Get connected. We are stronger together. And the vendors that I had, I found, I either got them and shared them with other people around me, or I went to meetings and I used the people that they referred to me. Joanna, I really, uh, I really love that. Um, so Myrna's reminder about look to your parents, um, your reminder of like, hey, you know, any connection is a connection and that can grow and be fostered. And then that last reminder that our programs are partners for one another. You know, we can reach out for one another. And the, the, the best way that I found to connect is exactly what you said is through the network for youth success, uh, through the events they host like this, uh, and, and to be able to find other people who are like-minded uh, and are looking for that kind of uh, that kind of option is is great, but you know your 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 willingness there just to kind of go out on limb and uh, and and say hey let let's take a try on this is something that after school programs can do, and so there are the I just want to remind people you know there's the 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 really obvious things like have the the fire department come in for a day and do fire safety you know there's that uh, give your public library a call. There's the, you know, some of those, some of those things that are just, just get out a, get out a map of the neighborhood or the community and take a look and see. And then there's some really innovative stuff like uh, Joanna was talking about there. Um, Mirna, do you have anything that you just want to add about, um, um, again, uh, kind of getting started? And then Val, I also want to come back to see if you've got any, like, how did you get to that advisory board? So uh, just thoughts for you, when you're starting with a school, you're getting in and you're maybe you're the only partner with that school, then then how do you go about uh, how do you go about expanding those partnerships? So initially, again, speaking, um, getting really connected with the principal is the primary partner and determining who within the school first has to be present, has to be there to decide or to determine who else we need to bring in. Looking at the resources in the community, and I was thinking about, yes, you have the fire department to do safety, and even um, we've had NYPD come in around safety, uh, just in terms of community safety. The other thought that came to mind is our, the hospitals that are in the community, and why? Because they get funding to do community outreach, and many of the outreach uh, encourages them to connect with schools as well. So how do we take advantage of those partners that are in our community that we utilize, right? Um, to be able to bring them in and also make services available for our families. The other partnerships that we've looked at is our neighborhood businesses. Our families frequent the businesses in our community, whether it's a local restaurant, 
So how do we engage the restaurants to give back as well? Maybe adopt a program or contribute to a program. How do we make sure that the community is beyond the school to reach out to the local businesses and other um, community-based organizations that have something to offer or that we can collaborate together in? It's really doing that kind of work and sitting down at the table together and identifying once again what are we seeing is a great need in many of our schools right now the greatest need is mental health um, so we've actually included we first let me get back to our structure um, because we are a large organization we have our our division if you will and i represent the youth division there are four domains that we cover in our schools we look at the educational domain in terms of our logic model we have the family and home, health, and then social emotional. Oftentimes, because we're large, we try to cover, and we do where we have our school-based health centers, we bring all of this in. Um, but there are some schools where we're just implement, not implementing, but we're still growing, like right? where we have different levels of, whether you're at a maturing stage or developing stage, then we look at who do we need to, again, what are the resources? Are we looking at it collectively? Um, in terms of, is it a food pantry that we need? We saw a lot of food insecurity during the pandemic, and there still exists food insecurity for many of our families. So it's not just what we bring because we have certain resources within our organization, but looking at local vendors or farms that can, we can contribute or bring um, fresh produce, organic produce to then distribute to our families. Again, it's really based on what are the surveys that we're disseminating to families so that we know exactly what the need is, depending on the region that we're serving. And again, the regions that we serve, we serve the South Bronx, there is Washington Heights, Inwood, East Harlem, Harlem, and Staten Island in terms of this work around community schools and community centers. Um, so it really is hearing from the folks that we serve and then responding as a collective to that need and identifying the partners in um, in many ways. The other thing I want to say in terms, again, we can't negate the value of our families because our families would come in and bring resources that they learned that are available to the community that other families are just not aware of. And this is another way to get the word out there. Well, I, uh, I think that, again, um, that the community, the community, the community. We keep hearing like, you know, so be out and about. I want to speak just to our rural, our rural context. A lot of times we have uh, our professionals in our schools. Again, a lot of obligations. They drive in. Uh, they do a great job in the school building and they drive home. And they may not really know all the resources that are out and about there. So I think it's um, a, how do you get started in that? And then how does that help a program continually improve. So Val, any thoughts uh, again on just uh, for you, where, where, what's your entry point for partnership or how do you, uh, uh, if even if you think back to uh, when we were doing some prep for the call, you said, well, we got started, we didn't have any, or we just had a few, how, how did it end up growing uh, like it did? We've got that strong advisory. So um, really uh, the challenge for me was um, hitting our targets at the high school level. And um, I felt as if, you know, we had no problem getting students or families engaged at the, the younger level. So I, I just started um, working with our team to ha hold um, family events here at school to bring as many people in as possible and just start having conversations like what their needs were and building those trusted relationships with the families. Um, so, so they would start sharing their needs and um, it doesn't hurt to bring coffee. Um, so, so our first few advisory meetings that were successful, was I started having them it, within the inside the community. Um, so we would uh, meet up at the coffee shop or we used a community library and, and brought families in to just um, chat and just and talk openly about um, what the need is. And, um, you know, food insecurity was one of them. So we partnered with Food Link out of Rochester um, to bring, um, to start a pantry here. And a lot of that work um, stemmed over the summer with the support of partnerships like um, Peaceful Schools 
and um, Finger Lakes Community Action. But um, a lot of people in the community, including parents, care. So as soon as they know that there is a need, they'll come to the table if, if, if it works for them. So I would rec recommend when you're forming your advisory, be open to um, understanding that uh, people, they want to give feedback, but they can't always make it to a meeting. So um, our first advisory meeting that we had was in July. And I thought, goodness, we don't have air conditioning inside. Let's have it at an ice cream shop. Let's have an ice cream social. Let's get, you know, go underneath the tent and just sit together and talk about how the school year went and how, how to move forward. And that's what we did. Um, we sent invites to local businesses. We invited, you know, it was a team of us that did this. We sent invites to um, parents um, and we really wanted to just hear from, from each other. So we had an open dialogue. Um, and then uh, that advisory grew. Um, so now we're working, really working on um, finding a common time that works for everybody. I think the coffee shop idea might be better. Um, so hopefully we'll go back to that and, and just feeling comfortable um, talking with one another. Uh, the other point is that we, um, we like to ask our students, you know, I had mentioned that our high school numbers were low and we we're like, well, why aren't you coming? So it goes back to what Joanna was saying. Um, you ha have the students help guide your enrichment and your, your activities. Um, we use student leaders, we support them, but we use alumni. You know, I wanted a theater, theater camp and I couldn't find anyone to do it. So we use alumni and we use a senior and they put the theater production on for our youth. It was the best the best thing ever, it was great. And um, then we invited all the families in to watch and they, and they um, that started building that, um, the idea of coming together to serve what our students are asking for. So um, we didn't have any trouble hitting our targets uh, later on with the high school numbers, but I really think that you need to focus on what the students want. In addition to the tutoring, you can offer tutoring, um, they'll come, but you'll, you're, you, you want to offer the enrichment and the activities that um, the kids are engaged with. Um, like, like we all stress, it has to be something that they seem valuable, like that they value and they want to learn. Um, we surveyed them and um, they, they want to learn, they want to do more field trips. So, and they want to learn about their surroundings. So that, that's what our focus is for the summer, is getting them out, out of town, get them, getting them to college campuses, maybe exploring some local parks. Um, Ed contacted um, Corning Museum of Glass. Um, so you know, our students and our, our families are saying that our kids want field trips. We weren't able to do all of those during the pandemic, so. Well, again, um, just to, to reflect back, I'm hearing really understand the need and then go find the people that can help meet that need. And, you know, starting, uh, you could start sometimes with a call, you know, out of your area. Um, you, you could reach out to Joanna, you could reach out to Val and say, Hey, who would you find around there? And like, well, I went here or there. And then you can look at your neighborhood and see, mm, gee, do I have that? Um, remembering the students themselves, the families themselves, uh, you're, you know, your mom, I guess, you know, could come in and do baking, you know, so who knows, we got, uh, but the resources are everywhere. And then it's, uh, it's on us to organize uh, those resources. So um, we're coming up on that, that one o'clock hour, we know some folks are going to need to jump off, we're going to stay and talk a little bit longer, and really start to get into some of the some of the questions. Um, Ali, I wanted to give you a chance to see, did you need to chime in uh, at the close of the hour here and offer anything particular? I see in chat, you've got uh, a reminder. Is there anything that you want to add in um, at this uh, at this juncture? Nope, that's all. Just please um, do take the survey before you jump off, but we hope that folks will stick with us for the next half hour. Great. And we'll uh, we'll keep rolling along here a little bit. And Joanna, you had a question that was aimed right at you, and it's uh, it's not top five dance moves. It's uh, top five partnerships uh, you should gather. If I understand the the uh, 
the concept right. And I think it's not just top five partnership tips, but what are the, uh, if to scroll back up and make sure I read the question, but I think it's the top five partnerships needed in an after school program. What kind of partners do you need gotcha. is how I read the question, but please come off mute and correct me or type in chat if I got that wrong and I read it wrong. Yep. So I'm going to, uh, and then I can adjust if needed. Um, what I would say the top five are, which was hard. After I had to think like, mm, which order? So please know that these are not in this specific order. Don't hold me to that. If any of my uh, school district partners are in here or parents, I don't, um, don't judge me. Okay. See me, at, see me privately about that. So <laughs> number one, um, I would say is the school district, right? Having direct access to a group of students to participate in anything you're planning is the number one. So they are definitely number one for the recruitment support that they can offer. Um, the second one I would say, now this is in no specific order, is um, the social having a, some, a social emotional support vendor or social workers who work directly within your program or counselors, whichever level you are able to have within your rural or city area. Um, what they add as a value is that they, they provide that opportunity to either train your staff Right. So I've had times where I've partnered with peaceful schools where the, what they did was provide a, a, a training to help my people to better assess our students needs and then to facilitate growth to cope with the things that they were dealing with. And then we were able to progress to a place where they then send someone who comes in as a professional to do that themselves with our students and to be a consistent face for our babies. Um, or that can also look like a mentor. So don't believe that it has to be only somebody who is a um, clinical social worker or has licenses. I have a saying, uh, certified doesn't make you qualified and qualified doesn't mean you're certified. So I never look down on a person based off of the fact that they haven't received a degree in something. We have a local group called um, Candles in the Sun, which sun stands for saving your neighborhood. And these young men are our local, they are called the heroes. They are literally local heroes, young men, and women traveling into our schools and our after school programs, providing mentorship and guidance for our children. So be open to whoever can offer social, strong, so socially emotional support. The next partner I would say is 4-H um, or Cornell Collaborative or Cooperative Extension, whichever way they word it in your area, find them. OK, they are a dynamic resource for the, the variety of workshops they can provide within your programming. They do a good job finding volunteers and people who are going to come and they pay them directly. Um, they they will also what I would say is they are a vendor or a partner. I don't even call them a vendor, even though I pay them um, for what they do, because I don't pay them their worth. That's the first thing which makes them a partner. The second thing is we have shared outcomes. And with those shared outcomes, when they have additional funding, they reach out to me to ask me, because I have the kids that they need, they don't have to recruit, they just need a place to plant themselves to provide a service. And so that's a dynamic partnership, right? I'm going to reach out to you to pay you for something, and you're going to reach out to me to say, I got some free money, and I just need a place to put them. I got kids, right? So you want to find partners like that. I'm telling you in advance, 4-H can offer that. Nobody yes. can have the people in my in Buffalo, though, because they are mine. All right? <laughs> but you go to your location, yours. <laughs> uh, parents are, you can't do this without the parents. But you, um, you, you got, parents give you a level of expertise working with their children that you wouldn't have if you didn't include them. And, and you, we're missing that, um, especially with our school day. We see more of that backlash because of COVID, keeping the parents outside and having the parents then do too much in their homes, right? In an after school or out of school program, you have the benefit of keeping the child's attention and giving them opportunities to just blow their mind and expand and let their parents see them in a different light. You can then tap into the parent to ask them what additional things can they offer. I've had a parent who was a, a expert crocheter. And she, when I asked her to come in and we do what we call as a reverse gift card. So um, this is a quick tip. Y'all don't have to pay me for this, but I'm gonna give it to you. Um, our organization does what I call a, I call parents gift cards. And so during each of our mandatory orientations, we um, start with this gift card. If it's in person, they get it. If it's uh, virtual, they get it mailed to them or they pick up their packet and then they're like searching for it. Right. I saw y'all faces when I said gift card. Y'all got excited. Right. 
They, because they believe they're getting a gift. What it is, is it's a reverse gift card. It's the gift they're going to give to our programming. And so on that card, it asks their name, what who their child is. It then asks them what, actually we removed who your child is because that doesn't matter. You're going to be a parent for the whole program with this gift card. It has Monday through Friday. It asks them what specific days they're available. And then what happens is then it lists out what hobbies they have, what talents they have, and what they do professionally. What we then do is my coordinators take that gift card, and now they can do strategic ask to a parent. If Shirley said on Thursdays she is available at 3 p.m. every Thursday, because she put that on the gift card, when we have an opening at 4 o'clock, on a Thursday and we need a program and it happens to be the thing that Shirley likes to do. Shirley likes to bake brownies and she loves anything bacon. I'm going to ask Miss Shirley, hey, Miss Shirley, we're looking to do something with the kids. The kids said they want it, right? Use the babies. The kids say they really wanted to do some baking. What's Shirley going to say? I love to bake. And then the next thing you're going to say, but she's going to say, I'm so busy, but we were looking to put it on Thursdays. Right. You see what you just did there. Right. You gave her you gave her the reason to say yes. And so you want to figure out what that looks like with your parents. How do you partner with them for them to be a resource, not only for the, their child, but for all of the kids in your program? And then the last one is vendors. Find people in your area or outside of your area willing to travel who are going to uh, what I call exploratory education is outside of just doing a field trip. It's people who can come in and give your kids something that they didn't know they, they like to do, right? I had some kids who would have never signed up for karate because in their mind, karate is just somebody hitting me. But I gave that they had to try it out. And because they've tried it out, it has now become the top vendor that we have in our programming because they got a chance to calm down. They learned how to meditate. They learned how to be, how to defend themselves, not be a bully, but how to defend myself if I am getting bullied with my mind and with my body, right? So those are my top five. All right. And if uh, you all come back for the next call, we're going to have Joanna show us her top five dance moves in the next one. That's uh, that's the next one. Not this one, though. So you gotta, you gotta come back. Um, Val, could you? Uh, and actually, you know what? I might flip this, and we might have you lead off here. Uh, what do you think? And, and there's a little bit of a test for Val, so I don't know. We'll see here. A little bit of pressure now. Uh, what do you think SOTUS does to get all the partners on the on the same page? That was a question. How do you get partners all on the same page? So, I, I, do you think that's going on at SOTUS? And if so, how does how does Val pull that off? How does Val pull that off? Well, I can tell you Val pulls that off by <laughs> being persistent. You have to be persistent. And I think all of us talked about this communication, communication, communication. We have parent square, we have email, we have phone calls, we do home visits. You have to do all of them. You have to meet the parents where they're at. You have to meet the stakeholders where they're at. Um, and I feel, I feel like the advisory board is what it is in SOTUS because of that. Like, we're so big on communicating. And if the parent doesn't answer, oh, let's go to the house. We'll, we'll get in our cars, go to the house, knock on doors. It Like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like, she is very good at what she does. And I am glad that I am learning from her. And I hope to be just as good as her one day. Oh, well... That's a nice well, comment. thank you. Um, but I'm going to give a shout out to both Jay and Ed because they they've taught me and um, it I'm learning. I like to network like everyone said, you know, if I was close to Buffalo, I'd call up Joanna, Joanna and say, hey, can I stop by? You know, when I was new at this, I called Clyde. I called Lions. I called Newark. I called all these local schools that were doing great things. And I said, can I can I come? Um, watch? Can I learn from you? Um, and when I had a question, you know, Jay has the partnership and he brings us all to the same table and we network and we say, hey, um, our kids are struggling with math. We want to help families help the kids with math. What do you think of this? Or we go to a network for youth success conference and you, and you get exposed to like math mango and then you start playing math games. So I 
I see where, um, thank you for recognizing me for that, but I think that um, the key point is collaborative. Uh, we're not in this, it's not just the school, it's the school working together with the families, with the parents, with the community, and with the partners. Um, so it's, there are children, like like it was emphasized earlier. So, um, and then and then celebrate that together because the work's not easy. <laughs> no. The work is not easy. One more um, thing. Oh, keep going. Ed. Go on. You, you, all, you also have to be available at seven or eight o'clock at night to make calls and text messages, or you got to be on Instagram, Facebook Messenger. Like we make sure we get, we communicate. So that I think is uh, um, really profound, and that it's you know a lot of times, you know. Uh, it sounds simple, uh, but it's hard, right? Like, and that's that's the thing of it. Like, people are like, "Well, what's the what's the secret?" And there's no microwave in this stuff. It it is it is uh, hard work, it, and so it is the the dedication. It's the devotion. It's the uh, the willingness to try something. And I think you're hearing from our entire panel that they are willing to grind. That they are willing to to put in the time. Uh, and I think that's something that you kind of got to expect. And part of what I really love about what I heard Val say was that um, to learn. So not just to go out and expect immediate success, but to go out and learn and to realize that you're always learning from your partners. It becomes a learning together piece. Um, and eventually then you get to that space where there are some questions about the, the nuts and bolts and the, uh, the fiscal value. And I want to re reflect back what I heard the panel say already, which is that a lot of times it's find the need, meet the need. Who can who can meet that need? The fiscal value a lot of times is indeed that um, the the CBO is going to provide a service the school can't, or the school is going to provide a contract that so because now the CBO has money that it didn't have before. Uh, you know, so there's some some kind of reciprocal nature set up there, but I do also think it's really important to go back to something that uh, Joanna said at the start. We see that with Val. I'm sure uh, Mirna, you see this. So I'm just going to kind of open this up to all of you a little bit. And um, I don't know. I don't have Jeopardy buzzers, so I'm not sure who's going to buzz in first. But um, when you're pursuing grant funding, a lot of times uh, you don't have to pursue just as as your agency. You're looking together. So there might be a grant that um, Val, the school's not eligible for, but, you know, I think you you might give, uh, actually, maybe I'll start with you real quick, Val, and then if other people could be ready about how you've looked for funding and resources together, uh, how you've gotten to a spot where you've looked for, looked for resources together with your schools or other partners. Uh, but Val, could you talk about the Soda Spade Junior Sailing Association? I know we've gotten a lot of emails on that grant. That's been something that's chewed up a little bit of our time, but I still think overall good for kids. And that comes back to the 21st century piece too. So we're lucky. Um, Soda um, is right on Lake Ontario. And um, we just 10 miles from the school district, we have, uh, you know, Lake Ontario, the beach and uh the Junior Sailing Association. Um, and I am a true believer that all kids should be able to um, have access to that, that water. So I've been on their scholarship committee for over 10 years, just because it's something I felt passionate about. I wanted all um, families to be able to ha have that benefit. So um, I remember being at a state conference and I met with, um, uh, someone with a 21st century grant. And I said, what do you think about me? Like getting kids on boats to learn how to sail. And um, Grant Grant said, go for it, put it, in, put it in your application. And so I did. So I was able to um, send, I think like five students sailing that summer and it was great. Um, and then it caught wind that wow, we can work together to write grants so that we could get more kids out there on the water, out on the water. And the kids really felt valuable. Um, they were like, I could never thought I could do anything like that. They learned STEM, they, they learned um, water safety, they, they connected to um, the staff there that were young adults, most college students. So they made these mentoring relationships. 
And they were like, Miss Fanning, I really want to do that again. So I thought, wow, well, I can't just offer it once. So um, we continued to um, work together. We we joined joined a we had a sailorship committee that was put together, and one of us just started working hard to write grants so that we can continue to send kids. And then other people caught wind that we were doing that, and we used we, we had a marketing campaign. So we hired a um, photographer that uses use drones and use cameras to go out in the water to really showcase and videotape this stuff happening which I you know Jay's really good he thinks about those things so marketing is a thing like Ed said you have to use social media and you have to reach your audience in different ways um, so we started getting a lot of people to to um, sponsor our, our kiddos um, so last summer um, and Ed I he he goes every summer so he knows i'm he he had 30 students down there sailing um for a full week learning how to sail and um we we learned that we had lost 21st century but um we worked together with the sailing association and um, um esl credit union to write a grant um, to sustain that work. So Jay and I received a letter that um, we were able to sustain $25,000 to send, um, you know, three times as many kids sailing. So uh, that partnership, it, it took a lot of effort, um, meetings, and, um, you know, now I have parents calling me left and right, can we please apply for that sailorship? Um, so the, the, the kids feel confident. Some of them have sailed now two year, two summers in a row and they're, they want to join the race team now. And, um, so, you know, they'll be in Buffalo racing um, or Rochester Yacht Club racing. Um, and then we were just recently at a, a My Brother's Keepers conference and Dr. A said, hey, I want to come out. I want to come out to SOTUS. You know, I heard, heard about the Yacht Club and I said to him, you know, we have kids racing boats. I got you got to go talk to Mr. Rose about that. Um, so it's pretty, pretty exciting. But again, we it was a collaborative effort. It, it, you can't do it alone. So it took a committee of passionate um, community members and students saying this is what we want. So. So what I love about that story is that it's a resource. Now, I, I don't mean to stereotype, but uh, most folks that own boats, I think of is having money. Now, maybe they spend all their money on the boat and all they have is that boat. But I think of folks that, so like, sometimes that's what we can do in our community is look at folks like, uh, uh, like there's a reason that we hold fundraisers at uh, golf clubs, right? At, uh, at, uh, at uh, because there's, um, it, it costs money to play golf. Like, you know, it, it's, it's not Frisbee golf where all you need is the Frisbee and, uh, and a free open course. You got to pay the membership and, and all that. So sometimes looking in your community and around your community and think, geez, where are there people that might not know about our needs that we might be able to build relationships with, that we might be able to communicate those needs and create create some hole there and that was something that Val did and uh and I think it's been a tremendous win for our kids and uh I think created a lot of empathy um and understanding uh in, in our community that is really needed um so there there's the fiscal reward came out of that authentic program and I think that's what I want you to hear from everybody here is that a lot of times the dollars and cents comes after you're doing something real if you're doing something real if then, then a lot of times the universe will conspire a little bit to help you, I think. Um, Mirna, uh, I'm going to ask you then just to talk about that, that fiscal, um, that fiscal benefit and how it might tie into, into partnership. And then Joanna, I'm going to close out with you to, to ask you that same question. So after Mirna, you're going to kind of uh, close out with this, gee, is that value add, including that fiscal value add that people are looking for sometimes? Is that something that, um, uh, uh, again, just something we could speak on based on a question we had? Sure. And I, when I hear Valerie's example, um, it just brings to mind, right, when you can show an outcome, 
when you can show that you've met the need, but more importantly, the outcome is long lasting. And also there's a, there's a continued need. And, and I can see that they're not just racing boats, but potentially I think of, uh, you know, regatta, like scholarships for youth in, in that kind of sport where we are, where there are so many of our children underrepresented. And so part of um, what we look to in terms of how do you find funding to secure and sustain our work, um, it's also talking to the elected officials. There are several opportunities with our community elected officials where they actually come to the community and they will say, we, they give the community the option of what is your ask, right? There's this city council dollars that we look to when they put out the ask and we look at what, and the we is the collective, going back to the parents, the school, the CBO, right? Because our advisory basically is the school leadership team that's comprised of teachers, the union rep, the principal, the community school director, parents, so that we can look at what is it that we need and we're mindful of who's going to go where. Um, the principals get a weekly memorandum, if you will, a weekly email that delineates all of the different grants that are available in partnership. We have a development office that we can take over and just not take over, but we can write that uh, proposal, if you will, because we know our partners are busy educating our students, right? Leading, being the lead educator. So we can then take that on and just we'll write the proposal, we'll get it together. Um, what else can we do? Also, our parents are good at looking for resources. I want to I continue to stress that because when we've had needs of other families they come in and they'll bring in canned goods uniforms that are no longer being used by their children who've transitioned out so that our families our new immigrant families have somewhere where they can come and get resources for their children that are entering the school um, it, it really is an all hands on deck and this is more than just this is not a job this is a calling like right? this work that we're doing is about service is about calling and it's about how do we just make sure that we make it happen and and go the distance there is the, the word the word quitting is not in our vocabulary the word giving up is not in our vocabulary we just go wherever we need to go to get that resources and then again looking at where there's flexibility in what we currently have to sustain a level of our programming that may be dwindling because the resources in that bucket are kind of wearing thin um, I'm mindful of time so i want to turn it over to joanna an excellent example of partnership being mindful of the space others need to operate look at that right there joanna you can close this right out give us uh yeah, give us some more of that uh that, that that advice, they got all that applause there. Uh, you you can close us out today. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna be honest. I said all I said needed to say. I just and my my counterparts here did all everything sincerely. Y'all spoke. I wrote my little post it out, and then y'all I had to keep crossing stuff off every time somebody said something. So just uh, I would say my closing remark um, is did all what they all said, and also add to it you have to be the advocate for that your program needs. Mm -hmm. If you are limited in what you're willing to offer, you are part of the problem as well. Mm -hmm. Be a part of that solution. Be the advocate, be the voice of your program. You're there, but you won't be there if you don't have funding. So go out and get it. You don't have, you have funding, but you don't have kids. You got to go get them right. You got to get staff members, um, build your social media platform up. Everybody, the majority of people are online. Is it everybody? No, but the majority of people are online. And even those who are not, when they are ready to look for something, guess where they're going? Online. So you got to make sure that you not only have an active website, that you then also have an active social media presence representing your program and you personally. I would, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you how many people send me private Facebook and Instagram messages to, to, to ask me about my summer camps. Are, are your summer camp applications out now? Or, hey, I got a program I want to pitch and I saw your pictures. Um, I kind of do something like that with kids too. I'm trying to, you know, get my feet wet. How do I get in there, right? But that's because I'm sharing photos. I'm sharing stories and I'm sharing when I need, I needed staff members. 
I share that on my personal page as well. Um, I will tell you, I, I, I accept most people to be my friend on Facebook. IG is private. So I'm not, I'm, that's, I need a place to be me all the way. <laughs> <laughs> but be that, I, I, I am willing to be that resource. And as Ed said, if you're not willing to be still working at seven o'clock, this ain't the place for you. We, we are, this, is, this job is more than a job. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. Be willing to have conversations wherever you are, if you're in the right room with the right people. All right. And if you are in the room alone, go get the right people in the room with you is what I'm hearing. You got to go get them. You got to go get them. So, um, and uh, one partner can lead to the next, right? So who do you know? Glad you're here helping us out. Who do you know? Because like Val said, you turn to the stakeholders and ask them to help solve the problem. Like Myrna said, go to the families, right? Um, Joanna gave an example. Uh, you know, she she transformed a, uh, an insurance uh, an insurance worker into, into into a dance star. So that's uh, you know, uh, and now there's children benefiting all over. And I got to tell you that uh, that that two hundred an hour. Man, maybe I ought to go home and practice my own dancing. Who knows? Hmm. You think, Ed, you think I can do it? <laughs> Anything you put your mind to. I want to see the tango, Jay, the tango. <laughs> the tango, yeah. Well, it, it has been, uh, uh, that talk about a partnership dance right there, the tango. So uh, uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, and we are really, uh, uh, really blessed to have this spectacular panel. Uh, this will be uh, uh, recorded and available uh, through uh, through the network. And I hope that you'll make good use of the Network for Youth Success resources. Uh, please, please, please connect with them. Um, and our next, uh, our next sustainability series is April 26th. And we'll also have a strand at the, uh, at the Networks Conference coming up here at the end of March. And that, that does it for us here today. And thank you so much for all your time. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Jay. And thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, this was such a valuable workshop and we really appreciate all of you joining us. Please do take the um, survey that was shared in the chat. You can also find a link to a list of potential resources in your uh, resources and partners uh, in your area uh, in the chat as well. Uh, thank you again. And we hope to see you soon.